You're listening to Frontlines, a podcast for the people that truly make mountain biking happen. Not the riders, racers, or product designers, but the builders, advocates, and the often forgotten board members of your local mountain bike trail association. We're calling an audible on this episode of the podcast. Before we get into our episode with Yvonne Krauss of the Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance and subsequent episodes with David Waynes of IMBA, I thought it would be helpful to get some background knowledge on various types of organizations in the United States. I sat down with Vernon Huffman of Access for Bikes in Marin County, California. They're no stranger to politics there. Despite Marin often being credited as the birthplace of mountain biking, if you visit there today, you'll notice that it lacks single track and more specifically, single track that mountain bikers are allowed to be on. Because of this, access for bikes is set up slightly differently than most trail associations in the United States, and it highlights some of the key tools that many trail associations still have, but might be underutilizing. So without any further delay, I'm your host, Brent Hillier, and this is episode 12 of Frontlines. My guest is Vernon Huffman, the president of Access for Bikes in Marin County. Hi, Vernon. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Brent, for having me today. What I'd like to start with, and uh, and for the benefit of some of my listeners that, that come from outside of the United States, could you explain to us what is a 501c3? A 501c3 is a nonprofit tax-exempt group organized under the Internal Revenue Code and they can engage in varying amounts of political activity and uh, usually for scientific purposes, educational purposes, religious, charitable purposes. But uh, these groups are supposed to not engage in political activities. So the majority of trail associations and IMBA chapters would fall under that category of, of being a 501c3. But Access for Bikes is actually a, a 527 organization. And what's the difference? Right. We uh, organized in 1999 and we chose to be a 527 uh, political group. That's a tax exempt group uh, organized uh, under Section 527 of the Internal Revenue Code. And we're allowed to raise money for political activities. So a little more background on that. Um, Marin County, as, as most people know, has been one of the more challenging places to gain fair and reasonable access to trails, uh, to the single track trails. So uh, because there's uh, some pretty established opponents to access and, uh, and there's uh, the... Um, those opponents use the political environment to block access. We decided that we would form a 527 political organization to work in the political world and to elect leaders of our uh, county and of our agencies, those leaders that are publicly elected, that had a open mind towards uh, mountain biking in our parks, mountain biking on trails specifically. And that's why we formed a 527 political organization. Uh, that does come with some drawbacks. Our a 527 political group is not, is, although it's a tax exempt group and can do unlimited fundraising, it is not a non, technically a nonprofit. Therefore, the donor is not able to enjoy a tax write off for their donation. So when you're referring to elected officials, you mean, you know, city council, uh, mayors, that type of thing? Well, that's uh, on a micro level. Yes, you could we could be talking about a city council. But in Marin County, city councils don't govern very much open space. So in Marin County, we're really talking about uh, two different organizations, uh, agencies that have uh, five elected leaders apiece. 
So one of those agencies is the Marin County Parks and Open Space. And the Marin County Parks and Open Space uh, manages, I think, about 30,000 acres of land where much of our fire roads and trails and recreational opportunities exist. That uh, agency is governed uh, by the their board of directors, happens to be the Marin County um, Board of Supervisors. And the Marin County Board of Supervisors, once a month, basically puts on their open space hats and they reconvene in, in their chambers as the directors of the Marin County Open Space. And then the staff of the Marin County Open Space brings their issues, you know, their, um, their budgets, their work plans, their uh, management plans. They bring those uh, before their board of directors and they um, look to the board of directors for approval uh, for whatever, you know, they are working on at that time. And uh, those board of directors then, there's five of them, and they have to vote, and the uh, majority vote basically would approve whatever that uh, vote is by the open space at the time. So those five leaders are elected leaders here uh, in the county of Marin. They all have uh, individual districts. So depending on where you live in Marin County, uh, every resident in Marin County lives in a uh, specific jurisdiction of one of those elected leaders. So Access for Bikes has worked to maximize and, and increase, and we continue to um, increase our membership so that we can have uh, influence over each and every one of those uh, five uh, jurisdictions, where districts where those, those votes occur. And over time, we've been doing this since 1999, over time, we have been successful in finding candidates for office, supporting those candidates for office, uh, helping them with their attempt and, and their work and their uh, effort to uh, gain, gain the support they need to A, run for the election, and then B, win the election. And, and we've been very successful in at least five election cycles here now. Um, and getting people on the board that uh, have an open mind to sharing our trails. That's the Marin County Open Space District. Now there's another district here in Marin that's a, a little bit more of a uh, struggle that we are also engaged in, and, and another reason why we formed 527, and that is that the Marin Municipal Water District which happens to be the largest land holder in Marin County, is also uh, governed by a board of directors, five board of directors, and those board of directors are publicly elected officials. Those board of directors meet twice monthly, and, uh, and they are the decision makers for all policies, management plans, rules, regulations, that the staff of the Marin Municipal Water District uh, establishes, they bring that to the board on a, on a twice monthly uh, basis. They also have uh, special um, subcommittees that focus on different uh, aspects of the watershed. We tend to engage in the watershed committee and they meet also monthly and they are a uh, group of the board of directors who decide issues on uh, watershed management. Those elected officials are, uh, again, broken up into districts, jurisdictions of the county. So every resident, voting resident of Marin County lives in one of those jurisdictions and votes on every four years. The, the, their office lasts four years, their term. And every four years, everyone here will have an opportunity to vote on their elected leader for the Marin Municipal Water District. Now. <laughs> this is particularly important in regards to the water district because currently mountain bikers enjoy approximately zero trails that we can access. We have zero narrow trails. We do have the majority of fire roads open to our use, but we have um, the Marin Water District has been uh, incredibly um, reluctant uh, if not uh, resistant to 
um, any change to the to the trail access issues for us. So this is a big um, big piece of work for us and a big priority of ours. Uh, we've got some board of directors who have um, been in office for over twenty years, and uh, some of these 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 directors have actually you know. Uh, written books on uh, history of Mount Tam. Um, they've, they've, they've got pretty much uh, entrenched, entrenched positions on uh, their view of mountain biking and uh, their, our use of the trail systems. So we engage on that level to, to create change and we intend to uh, work to get, get new directors uh, until we have at least three out of five board of directors who will work with us to create more opportunities uh, for for narrow trail access. Hmm. Well, and it sounds like this is the case, but uh, from from a mountain biker's perspective, government politics is very important, and and it's it's important to for for us a mountain biker to be aware and to be clicked in into what's happening, whether it's it's uh, you know local. Or, or beyond, um, and and what would you say to the average mountain biker that that maybe isn't aware of of how much their political power, how much their their elective uh, power has to do with with where they ride and where they can ride mountain bikes? Well, I would encourage every mountain biker to not take any of their access for granted. And first of all, there's you know there's many ways that they they need to engage. Never take it for granted. Uh, every mountain biker, no matter where they live in this, whether it be the United States, uh, Canada, or, uh, you know, across the globe, uh, a mountain bikers, it's really their duty to understand where they ride and who manages the property that they ride on. Uh, some of the best opportunities we have are on private property where mountain bikers have had an opportunity to design courses, rut trails specifically for biking. Usually we know when we're on a private property because we have to, you know, go through a certain set of uh, hoops to get, get that permission, and usually it's well signed. But uh, in other cases, when we're on public lands, we don't really know whose land we're on. And oftentimes trails, uh, optimally trails, you know, that are long and, and enjoy, enjoyable and just put us in our happy place, they just go on and on and on. But oftentimes they cross jurisdictions and we don't always know exactly when those jurisdictional lines occur. So I think it's really important that a mountain biker, when he's not on that trail and, and, or when he has some free time and, and wants to give back to the community, that mountain biker needs to really understand where he just rode or where he want, anticipates riding, he or she, that is, and looks into it, gets gets to know who that land manager is. It could, one of the easiest ways for that mountain biker to do so is to find their local advocacy organization. Most places, uh, because mountain bikers have been around now for 30 or so years, have formed a advocacy group to help people get engaged, to help care for our trails through volunteerism, and to help advocate and work with our land managers to care for our system and to be an asset to those land managers. So it's really, it's really important that we, we seek out our advocacy groups. And if we don't have an advocacy group, then form one. Uh, there's guaranteed there's other mountain bikers that you'll find that, that you could work with to form an advocacy group. And then once you find that group or, or you, you find it or you form it, Find those land managers who who owns those trails and and be an asset, be helpful, show up. And if they don't have trail work, be there for them and form your own, uh, form your own opportunities. And those land managers will uh, most most often will appreciate it and will take you up on it. And you will form partnerships with them that will benefit your your own riding and your your friends and the future of mountain biking. Awesome. So Access for Bikes is currently in the process of creating a, a parallel organization, which is going to have a 501c3 status. Uh, what was the reasoning behind that? 
five to seven political organizations uh, are important, especially where you have uh, land that is governed by elected leaders. So there are other places in our country and beyond where perhaps your land managers aren't elected leaders, and that can be something like a, a BLM or a U.S. Forest Service or Department of the Interior, if it, National Park Service. And those properties, are they, they're a little different than most of the land here in Marin, where those uh, managers of those lands are not elected leaders. So you, you don't have as much opportunity to engage on that level and influence who the, the manager of that land will be. And that's where a traditional C3 nonprofit is uh, more effective because those land agencies depend on partnerships and the services, the volunteerism and the fundraising that a C3 can um, can establish for you. So here in Marin County, as a 527, we tend to, we're so engaged in the political process that it oftentimes uh, creates almost a, it, it oftentimes creates an edgy relationship with our land managers. We we're engaged in the political process and, and by engaging in the political process, we sometimes have to, we have to call out things that aren't really fair. We have to call out things, situations that um, aren't um, equitable to user groups such as mountain bikers. And in doing so, we have to do so to, um, to find the leaders that, that we want in office. But in doing so, it can create a somewhat uh, tenuous and uh, strained relationship with some of these land managers. And it's the nature of our work, and, and uh, we, 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 we live with it. We live in that world, and, but uh, it, it makes it somewhat harder to maintain the partnership. So there's also another angle to the 527 that, that you'll find and that um, some donors really do need that that write-off, that tax write-off to give you that, uh, that inf infusion of funding. So, and that's exactly what's happened here with some of our donors. They've said, look, you know, you guys, we, we really enjoy, uh, I, I give more if you gave us a tax, if you had nonprofit tax refund status. So that led us to you know, our board to discuss the matter. We've been engaged in, in the conversation for well over a year and a half. And we, um, have decided to move forward with a somewhat parallel organization. That organization uh, it will be titled the Access for Bikes Foundation. The Access for Bikes Foundation will form as a traditional C3. We already have our founding four board members uh, for that organization. I will sit on the board uh, for now while the organizations get formed. And that organization's mission is to um, st basically exist as a stewardship organization of our local trails to help uh, fundraise where where monies are needed to help staff and to help staff uh, volunteer events to care for the trails that we have and when the opportunities exist to build new trails to to staff trail building days uh, for the agencies so that that organization is so that we can focus on trails. Everyone loves trails. Everyone loves building trails, maintaining trails, riding trails. Most C3s stay out of the political um, world and enjoy a more traditional symbiotic partnership with public land agencies and stay out of the, you know, some of the difficulties that a 527, as, as we are and we know, it's just part, it's just un, unavoidable in some cases to, you know, to venture into this more strained um, uh, conversation, you know, that we have. So the C3 will, as a parallel organization, will allow us to be free of, of the politics and just work on trails and, and be good, good stewards and partners with our agencies. So can a 527 organization become an IMBA chapter? That's a great question, Brent. And it actually is one of the reasons that we've, we've pursued this, um, this option. So we've been working with our local um, state EMBA rep 
for a couple of years now trying to uh, entertain the idea of becoming a EMBA chapter. We are big supporters of EMBA. We, we appreciate all of the help EMBA gives uh, their chapters. We appreciate the work that EMBA does in the, in California, in the, in the state capital of California, the work they do in our nation's capital to secure mountain bike uh, infrastructure and funding, very, very important work. So in trying to help them help us, we've thought a chapter was a really good fit. Marin County currently has, has never, does not have a chapter, has never had a chapter, and we'd like to change that. So in that pursuit and working with uh, Laurel Harkness, our, our representative, we've learned that a 527 cannot become a chapter. Uh, because of their 501c3 nonprofit status, it creates um, exposure and, and complications that uh, they they cannot um, be involved with. So one of the reasons we considered forming a C3 was to resolve that exclusion and to uh, enable Access for Bikes to become a chapter here in Marin County. And so through the C3 and the Access for Bikes Foundation, that will basically open the door again to establishing those talks and to talking with Laurel and getting more of a, a green light to be able to eventually have a chapter in Marin County. Fantastic. So you've got your annual Ales and Trails coming up. Uh, what is it and, and how can folks get involved? Ales and Trails uh, will be celebrated on May 20th, 2017 in Miwok Meadows, a lovely site on the uh, bay of uh, Richardson Bay in, in China Camp State Park. This is uh, in San Rafael, California. Ales and Trails is a celebration of bikes, a celebration of trails, a celebration of bike culture, a celebration of uh, micro beers and advocacy groups. So we put out a, a broad invitation to Bay Area counties and those advocacy groups that are working in their communities to improve trail access and trails for other mountain bikers. We put out a broad invitation to those groups to come. They set up their booths and they educate the attendees as to what they are doing for the mountain bike world. We invite numerous uh, bike companies to the event who brings their product we have bike demos that uh, are included in the in the fee for the event that people can if they're in the market for a bike or they just want to ride something different they can demo a variety of, of bikes that day find out what the latest and greatest ride is the beer selection this year i've got a, a volunteer who's just killed it this year and he's got some craft brewers coming uh from the Bay Area that uh, are just some of the best of the best. We have a barbecue this year by a, a great barbecue meister who's, who's um, everyone, no one, no one leaves hungry from this event. For uh, an all-inclusive price of $40, you get your uh, swag bag, killer pint glass with some uh, event socks. You get your barbecue, your unlimited uh, beer tasting, you get your bike demos, and you get uh, guided rides on uh, China Camp State Park. Different um, themes for your rides. We have the Old Fart Ride for 65 and over. <laughs> We've got your NorCal Ride by one of the executive directors of the NorCal High School Mountain Bike League is in a leader ride. Uh, that always attracts some of the high school kids, but other, the, other, the, other people that just want to engage with the league and find out what that's about. We've got a little Bella's, Bella's ride for the young girls getting into mountain biking. Uh, we've got uh, REI coming with um, their fleet of bikes, and they've got some special some clinic rides where they're going to help teach people about switchbacks and cornering, and, and they they always put on a good uh, variety of options there. So this uh, this event will attract uh, four or five hundred people over the day, and. Uh, just a great community feel and, and one of one of the 
funnest uh, events of the year. This event is Access for Bikes' most uh, important uh, fundraising event of the year. Well, Vernon, thanks so much for taking the time to, to chat with me. I really appreciate it. I think every mountain biker can learn a lot from Marin. The first lesson is to never take your trails for granted. I'd also like to highlight some of Vernon's comments. He said, there are many ways that riders need to engage. And I couldn't agree more with Vernon in the fact that it's a rider's duty to, and I'll quote here, understand where they ride and who manages the property they ride on. I asked around and compared nonprofit regulations within my own country of Canada and that of the US. We have registered charities, and very similar to the United States and their 501c3s, these groups cannot act in a political capacity. We also have nonprofits that, like 527s and Access for Bikes, they do not provide tax receipts. And from my understanding, these groups have some more flexibility and freedom to support specific parties and candidates during elections. As far as elected officials go, here in the Vancouver area, only the municipalities are elected. Provincial parks, conservation areas, and crown land are managed by government organizations that are staffed, and these staff members are not elected. If mountain biking is going to continue to grow, and if you want your local trails to be around tomorrow, then it's important to get involved, both on a club level and on a political level. If your club is a registered charity, they may not be able to tell you who to vote for, but I can assure you that not all candidates in an election will be good for mountain biking or the environment that we need for mountain biking to succeed. It may be up to you to do your homework, and more importantly, it's up to you to vote. If you'd like to get involved with the podcast, then you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at FrontlinesMTB. I'd like to know what type of status your local club has, what are the laws of nonprofits in your country, and what are the unique things happening wherever that is. If you want to include your voice in future episodes, then send me an audio file. My email is brent at bikeski.ca. You can also find me on social media at Brentski Bikeski. And if you want to learn more about Ales and Trails, then go to alesandtrails.com. And you can find Vernon and Access for Bikes at accessforbikes.com. That's access, the number four, bikes.com. If you have a story that you'd like to share, then please reach out. Frontlines is always looking for new contributors so we can offer different voices, views, and opinions. If you want to support the show, then go to bikeski.ca slash support and donate via PayPal. Any amount helps and will go towards bringing you, the listener, the best content possible. If your business is looking for a new and different marketing opportunity, then contact me about advertising on the podcast. I'd also like to give a shout out to the Albury Wodonga Mountain Bike Club out in Victoria, Australia. They're in the process of having their local trails audited by the Department of Land and Environment. And for the last year, they haven't been able to maintain their local trails. All I can say is be patient. I'm sure that the vast majority of the community appreciates what you're doing. And on behalf of Frontlines and its listeners, you have our support. And many, if not all of us, know what you're going through. You're not alone. Next episode, my guests will be Yvonne Krauss of the Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance and Eric Albers of the Cold Creek Mountain Bikers, a chapter of Evergreen. Once again, music is by Lee Rosevere, production notes by Jennifer Pride, and finally, I'm Brent Hillier. This is Frontlines. Thanks for listening, and happy trails. <laughs>